Thank you. Tom at one point mentioned um, edge spaces and um, the French Bamu. And I just want to let everybody know or remind everybody that we have a, an exhibition coming up um, that starts in at the end of June called Mohamed Bouissa Urban Riders, who deals very much with um, that theme. Thank you for that talk. Um, our last speaker today is Man Bartlett, whose work you saw when you came in on the ceiling of, of the light court. Um, so he is one of the artists in our exhibition. Um, do you want me to, to read? Where are you? Do you want me to read the year that you were born? <laughs> it's, it says it here. Man Bartlett is a multidisciplinary artist who lives and works in New York. His diverse practice includes sound, drawing, collage, video, performance, and digital projects that often use online platforms as outlets for playful yet subversive social critique. And he's going to talk today about um, his project upstairs and hopefully about some of the other things that he's been, he's been very involved um, in lots of different aspects of this exhibition. Man Bartlett. If you could uh, indulge me in a moment, and if you could all stand up. It's been a long day. Blood maybe needs to flow a little bit. So if you could just move your body just a little bit, just like shake it out maybe. Move your legs, your feet probably need to move. And like if you can, just like stretch all the way up. Yeah, all the way up. Ah, let that out. Let's do a big in breath, and then out breath. Ah, and then shake that out. And then move one seat. So I don't care where you move, just move to a seat that you hadn't been sitting in before you just got up. The reason for that is the seat that you have been sitting in is probably a little warm. And now you'll have a nice, new, fresh, cold seat. So the, the idea in sort of starting over here is to play with the, the notion of, um, of audience and spectacle and uh, this idea of gawking, which I think was really interesting to hear Bridget talk about. And this unpredictability, um, which I have to tell you, uh, I have some slides that I'm going to show. I'm going to talk about some of my work and some of the work that I think um, I've seen online and in uh, person for the last couple years. Um, but beyond that, I don't really know what's going to happen. So I'm trying to keep this as open and flexible as possible. So we'll see how that goes. We, we ready for that? We got a little blood flowing a little bit? OK. First, uh, thank you to the Barnes, to Tom, and to Martha um, for inviting me to, to uh, come to this space. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, so it's a, a very particular honor to be able to uh, be here right now. It's kind of 100% um, surreal, actually. So. Um, unbelievably grateful for this opportunity. So radical listening um, with me. Um, quick, name is man. It comes from a manual. It's a nickname. So in case you're wondering, um, I wear that sort of as um, a reminder that I need to be a better representation of my gender. And so it keeps me uh, as honest as possible. Um, and I'd like to start with this sort of amazing um, and ridiculous um, quote from The Independent, that analysts at Bank of America have reportedly suggested there is a 20 to 50% chance our world is a matrix-style virtual reality and everything we experience is just a simulation. So that probability is probably less. If you're Elon Musk, you say it's one in a billion, right? That, that, and what this means is, is that, has people seen The Matrix, by the way? I know it's been like a long time. Yeah, show of hands, seen The Matrix? No, OK, so, so basically the idea that we live in a simulation, that this reality, and, the, and this, the philosophy goes back many, many years, um, not just the matrix. But I think, um, and smarter people than me know the, the full history of that. I'm not an academic, so um, take that as you will. Um, but I think there's something to this notion that how we experience, um, how we experience either the reality or the simulation of reality. And I think about this when I'm, listening to lectures or when I'm on the subway, and it informs a lot of my relationship to uh, the things that I create and the things that I look at. My history in coming to this stage is a sort of a very long roundabout path. Um, I actually started in the theater. 
Uh, my degree is uh, from Emerson College in Boston. And at some point during my uh, college studies, I came across Uber Roth, um, Alfred Jerry's 1896 play. And what, I won't go into the, the details, but what struck me most about this is that it was a production that, that started in a riot and that the entire audience rioted. Um, and the opening word of the play is a bastardization of the word shit. And so that sort of like um, boldness or kind of like the absurdity of that action was just really enthralling to like, you know, 19-year-old man who's like, yeah, let's like make some crazy shit. Um, and it stuck with me um, to the point where even though there is not much of a uh, correlation, and I think a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today, there's not a lot of correlation um, directly to even the idea of a flanor or a cyber flanor. But I think that there's a relationship between space, people in space, and, and either the audience perspective or the individual viewer's perspective. And so as you'll see, the sort of stream of consciousness that plays throughout here, um, each of these works are kind of touching them in different capacities. Um, so the work you're seeing on the right here is Wafal Bilal's 2007 uh, Domestic Tension. Um, the original name for this piece was Shoot an Iraqi. And I happened to be living in Chicago at the time. And um, I actually had just gotten my first gallery show with the gallery where this was being presented. So I was there at the, uh, the opening sort of reception. And basically the piece, he's a, an Iraqi uh, American citizen. And it was to recreate the feeling that his brother had um, living in Iraq during the war, um, unable to leave his house. And so he rigged a paintball uh, machine to shoot that the internet could control. So you could go online, go to a website, and control this paintball gun and choose to shoot him or not. And there have been very few experiences in my, uh, in my artistic life where I've had the chance a, to witness something like that in person, but to be exposed to something that was so visceral, so conceptual, yet performative, and also just completely insane. Um, from a perspective of giving the audience control um, over uh, a paintball. And it wasn't, it's, you know, paintball, if you get hit by it, it hurts a lot. It's not just like, oh, it's like, no, it really hurts. Um, and Wafal documented this uh, performance over the course of the month of the exhibition. And so you sort of saw him progress. And he stayed in the gallery 24 hours, um, seven days a week. And, and he subsisted just off of the things that people would uh, bring to the gallery, so just uh, food that was brought to him. And so I think about this idea of the audience, and I think about the people that, and so one of the amazing things that happened during this is that um, these groups of people started um, coming together to, to make sure the gun was pointed away from him. And so the crowd was actually controlling the gun and making sure, they had a name like Angels or something, um, to keep it away. And I think that's an amazing sort of um, outcome of something that could have gone a much different way. So I moved to New York in uh, 2008 uh, to work at a startup. I was promptly laid off. Uh, so I was like, oh, great, what am I going to do? So I left New York, traveled for um, almost a year. And when I got back, um, I was trying to figure out like, what, what shape uh, my practice would take. And in the intervening years between theater and getting to New York, I had started making visual work, really terrible paintings, which is why you're not seeing any of them here today. Um, really bad. Um, but I started thinking about what, uh, how performance could um, expand into social media. And so I did this piece called 24 Hour Best Non-Buy, where I spent 24 hours in a Best Buy shopping but not buying anything. And so what that entailed was me literally going up to every single product in the store and having a personal relationship to that product to say, it, to do a little internal checklist. Do I need this? Do I want this? And then ultimate, ultimately concluding that I was not going to buy it. So it sort of became my mantra. And the project actually was an outgrowth of an experience that I had where um, I was uh, desperately broke and needed to borrow money from a friend uh, to buy a computer that had been stolen. And after I bought the computer, I realized that I couldn't afford to keep the computer. I needed to pay my rent uh, at the place where I lived. And so in order to return this computer, um, it took me something like two hours waiting in line. And then they were trying to do all these, like, they weren't going to give all the money back. And it was this unbelievably humbling and demoralizing um, experience. But also when I realized that this particular Best Buy in New York is open 24 hours, which is kind of um, insane. Because you might need a cable at 4 in the morning or a new television. Um, so all right. How are we doing, by the way? Feeling good? If you need to stand again, just like stand. It's cool. I leave that up to you now. Um, so 
this is a piece by uh, Jonah Bruckner Cohen, and it's actually, I kind of love this. The GIF is not supposed to look like this at all, but in the translation from the Macintosh to the uh, Windows computer, it has this kind of amazing effect going on. Um, but basically, the piece is a drill that was installed, um, and it's been uh, installed a couple different places over the years, but um, where a, uh, a hit to a website correlates to an actual hit of this drill into the building. And again, this relationship between an audience taking an action and something happening in real world. And that's something that I'm deeply fascinated in because of how we communicate today. Um, and this is another project that's really grown on me over the years um, from John Rathman. And basically, um, John just scoured Google uh, uh, Street View and looked for interesting scenes uh, all, over, all over the world. And so we'll just sort of scroll through some of these. Um, And they really tell a story. I mean, in some sense, these are just found objects. And I remember very distinctly thinking at the time that um, where, where does, where, what is the genesis for a work of art? And this is maybe a deeper philosophical question. But when you take something, um, and it's essentially a copy, um, where does it exist outside of just the action of looking, right? And over the years, I've come to sort of, I keep returning to this piece because I keep thinking about how it's essentially just a snap, snapshot, but through Google um, and through a sort of uh, technology which has come to rule uh, much of our lives, whether we realize it or not. And these are some just bizarre and sometimes devastating scenes. And there's little or no context ever given to um, what was happening. Um, they're not explained. And from what I could see online, uh, the artist didn't even provide a very clear synopsis of, other than to just have a website. And he's talked about this project, and this project has been talked a lot about. Um, so I started doing these 24-hour performances. Um, partly as an outgrowth of that experience in, in uh, Best Buy, but also as a way to kind of um, expand my relationship to time. And living in New York, which is a very like uh, intense place, like all the time, you're always kind of like super stressed and like you're not sure if anything's ever gonna work. Um, it gave me an ability to kind of, um, yeah, to expand time and to kind of decontextualize time. So while it's a very rigid structure, uh, performance in 24 hours, it has a very specific beginning and end time. Um, what happens in between that gets elongated into this very surreal kind of um, durational uh, experience. And for this particular piece, which is a commission from uh, Creative Time, I went to uh, the most amazing place in New York, uh, Port Authority, and um, spent 24 hours there talking to people. And I talked to them uh, in line when they were going somewhere. So they were traveling to meet their family. And I talked to them online about where they had been. And sort of the idea was to see if I could match those two audiences and make any kind of connections um, between people who I was meeting in person and people who I was talking to online. Um, and interestingly, it was, it was uh, the, the construct was uh, the performance was a failure. I'll put that as bluntly as possible. And that I found that in order to stay engaged, um, I either had to be in one place or the other, right? So I either had to be here, like, OK, we'll have a conversation. Like, how's it going? How are you feeling? Yeah, doing good. Do I'm doing good, thanks. Yeah, it's like, it's going all right. I think you still have the attention, so I feel OK. It's not mine. Or, thank you. <laughs> not yours? It's not mine. Got mine. OK, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I'll try to keep it. Or I had to be completely separated from that and mediating the experience through trying to communicate to people online. And so when I'm talking like, oh, I'm giving a talk right now. So this, this disconnect, it's a cognitive disconnection, but it's also a very, um, you're accessing a different part of your brain. And so these performances, these 24-hour performances, were trying to kind of meld those two or um, kind of see if I could exist in two places at once. Um, and I, I, I couldn't. Maybe other people can. I think uh, there have been some amazing people continuing work in this sort of um, particular area. 
who have done it better than I, but I just know I couldn't I couldn't do it. Um, so part of the outgrowth of um, those performances of which I did uh, quite a few was I started thinking about other durational performances, and this was right around the time that Occupy Wall Street. Um, and I had been in London doing a project, um, and I came back right as it was sort of ramping up. And I started thinking a lot about the um, individual's relationship to the gallery system and to, um, to money um, specifically, and how we earn a living as artists, and where the kind of smoke and mirrors are. And I was talking to a lot of artists who were saying, you know, well, um, I get money from this place, or I get money from here, or I uh, have a trust fund, or I get this particular collector and this particular donor. Um, and it's a very touchy subject. You gotta be careful when you talk about this stuff. And I actually had one uh, artist friend of mine say, you know, you really can't talk about that. Like, I wanna tell you privately that this is a cool project, um, but you will end up on blacklist for this. Um, so it's, uh, basically I spent a year documenting my finances and um, put them publicly in the form of a Twitter account and then uh, as a Google document where anyone could see. And if you can look at some of these, let's, let's get the laser pointer out. Um, Kombucha tea ice cream, um, protest sandwiches, photocopies, McDonald's and Starbucks. I had a terrible diet. Um, and people would comment on that. And people would reply to this account and say, you need to eat better, um, which was not wrong. But I was a little bit like, come on, like, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. Um, and I started this project with something like $70 to my name. And I ended this project with something like $70 to my name. And the entire thing. Um, was documented for a full year. Um, and it really was awkward. I had, um, particularly when there were art sales. So I wouldn't say who the collector was, but I would say the amount. Um, I wouldn't say what the work was, but the amount that, I would, that, was, that, were, that was income was in there. So this sort of radical transparency um, is something that I, that I kind of play with and then go a little bit back away and then come up uh, and kind of look at again. Um, so yeah. So this is a really um, interesting project uh, by Heather Dewey Hagborg. And um, basically, she went into different uh, areas in New York and found pieces of chewing gum, cigarette butts, um, hair, extracted the DNA from them, and then made portraits um, loosely based off of that uh, particular DNA's information. Um, and I think about this particularly in relationship to kind of what we've been talking about today, right? where you had people going out into the streets, uh, strolling, looking at what's happening, gawking, and then building stories based around that. So I think if we go back to the, this morning, and the, the Andre showed that image of the, the train, uh, the bridge, and it was really, uh, it, you, got the, you got a sense that you were there seeing the story, right? And I think what's interesting to me about this is that when you see a piece of gum, and if you pass a piece of gum on the street, you might be able to invent some story about it. But technology is getting to the point where you can actually make an approximation of what someone might actually look like. Um, and that's both terrifying, um, but from a conceptual standpoint, really interesting. Um, and what are the implications of that, of how we um, exist in public and how we exist um, in space? So I was, I was going to show the Vito Conchi piece. I was really close to including it, and I was like, nah, you know, like, we know that one. Uh, and it was gonna be a setup for this one, um, which is Lauren McCarthy's follower. And uh, I just, I really love this quote from the video. Uh, well, first I'll give you the, the brief introduction of the project, which is uh, a service that, um, that grants you a real life follower for a day, no hassle, unseen companion, someone that watches, someone that sees you, someone who cares. And this notion that you, know, you, could, you could order someone to follow you around all day uh, with the equivalent being of a social media follower but in real life. And you don't know that that person's there. And then the result is that they, they take one photograph of you and that's sort of the product that you get out of this. And I don't want another relationship. I just want to have a relationship with somebody that I never have to talk to. They can just follow me and see me having a relationship with myself. Which like, I don't know how many people you, ha okay, uh, another poll of the audience here. Who has a Facebook account? Okay, does anyone not have a Facebook account? Just out of curiosity. Cool. Oh, wow, that's a great, that's a good number. So for those of you that do have a Facebook account, if you use it with any regularity, you understand how the system is, is completely rigged against you to exploit you, and um, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but um, 
I would assume that you have some awareness and understanding of what it feels like when someone either friends you or follows you uh, or likes something that you posted. Um, and so this project brilliantly kind of took that idea into physical space. Okay. I don't think I have anything else on that one. So um, this is a recent work um, called Browsing the Blues. And it's part of a ongoing investigation into the audio space, right? And it's taken a couple different forms. I did a project that didn't really make sense to include here a couple of years ago where um, I created a 24-hour audio collage that um, uh, mimicked uh, times of day. So I've been thinking a lot about audio and, and what our relationship uh, is to it. And so this piece took, um, I had an iPhone that I had a electromagnetic microphones that I hooked up to the iPhone. Um, and I was able to record the electromagnetic output of my phone while I was browsing my social media feeds. So the idea is that you're making um, audible the device that you use um, to do, or at least the device that I use uh, way more than I should to kind of connect to the world. Um, and the results, uh, which we can listen to, So you're hearing two things. Uh, one is actually a, a drone generator that I have, and the other uh, coming up, the staticky stuff coming up, that will be the electromagnetic. And so the sounds are me scrolling, me opening an app, Liking something. So you get the idea. 20, 27 minutes of this. Um, but having that kind of uh, audible relationship to what the actions are helps me understand um, in a different way. It gives me another in, um, input into what. Oh, I didn't fade it out. So there you go. That was it. Um, and actually, I was in that show. Uh, Angie was in that show by uh, total coincidence. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was the that was the uh, the show at Arabite. Um, so, internet noise is not an art project, at least not um, explained as such. Um, but it's a project that um, Dan Schultz started uh, very recently, um, and it's to basically create um, noise on your browsing history. And the purpose is that all this information is being collected um, about you when you uh, do anything online. And, um, and, and this sort of the idea uh, is to obfuscate your browsing by throwing out um, browser tabs with a bunch of sort of uh, misleading information. So two of the ones that I got from a recent um, experiment with this was uh, disengagement pneumonia raincoat, which is kind of awesome, and playing the Alphorn. Um, and so I think a lot about what, you know, when you're looking at something online, when you're, tr when you're browsing, when you're Googling um, information, this is, these are, in some sense, physical destinations that you're traveling to. And the situation is such right now um, that lots of very powerful interests are watching you every step along the way. Um, and effectively, this is like a very clear um, a correlation with following. <laughs> um, and I think that the question then becomes, what do we do with that? And that's not something that I am, have any authority to, to speak about. Um, I have very personally mixed uh, feelings about what it means to be tracked today and what it means to, um, to have that information accessible. Um, I think that privacy is an important thing that we just have awareness of what's being collected from us, and then we can make decisions accordingly, not to get overly didactic about it. Um, OK. So I have two things that I'm going to show now, and then I promise I'm going to talk about my Barnes thing. I promise. Coming soon. I'm saving it for the end. So, um, But these two things to me are kind of they're interrelated. One is the million dollar, uh, million dollar homepage uh, from 2005. Um, where uh, this person basically just uh, sold real estate uh, on a website in order to help uh, fund his college uh, tuition. 
by selling a pixel for a dollar. And there are a million pixels, so it's a million dollars. It's a brilliant project. Um, and it, it, again, not really an art project, more like a social experiment. And uh, recently, um, actually just a couple weeks ago, Reddit, as an April Fool's um, Day sort of hijinks, they did something sort of similar called Plays. And what you're seeing here is a time lapse of 72 hours um, where any Reddit user could add a single pixer, pixel once every five minutes to the canvas. So there's a, you should, it's, this story of how this kind of came to be is worth reading if you haven't uh, looked into it. It's fascinating what happened over the course of this 72 hours. You can see that sort of black, um, the little black, oh wait, hold on. I went too soon. We're gonna watch it again because it's a cool thing. Um, oh wait, I gotta go back twice. Let's see here. There we go. They make the, the laser green and the forward green, which is a little confusing. Um, but you can see this sort of black area that started taking over the piece at a certain point. Um, by users who were intent on destroying this sort of community. Um, but ultimately, they didn't win. Yay, for once, like, the trolls didn't win. And it did turn into like a little Pink Floyd thing, which is kind of funny. Um, as a work of art, I mean, this is like maybe as low brow as you could possibly go. You've got the Mona Lisa, that OSU, and like all types of um, pretty like tacky things going on. But as a communal experiment, it's actually really fascinating what um, developed over that, that 72 hours. Um, OK, uh, last but not least um, is my project here. Um, so has everyone gotten a chance to sort of see in the lobby? Yes, maybe. Um, if you haven't, it's in the lobby upstairs. Um, and the project is called We See, We Hear, We Are. And um, it was developed over the course of uh, many months in uh, collaboration with Shelley Bernstein, who's here. Who, Shelley, if you're watching, thank you. Um, also, hi to the live stream viewers. Um, but it was uh, an outgrowth of a conversation in this relationship between uh, physical space and the idea of being a flaneur and digital space and, and being online and what it means to exist online today. And the sort of specific uh, entry point begins with um, the we see component which is uh, you're seeing a still from a website which uh, is connected to uh, Instagram's API. So anytime someone posts with the hashtag person of the crowd, this uh, AI uh, attempts to interpret the image that has been posted, right? So person standing in front of a television. So the, the application went to the Instagram uh, feed to the hashtag and looked at it and thought that it saw a person standing in front of a television. Then it puts that into language and it reads it out loud. So if you go into the lobby, you can hear it, um, the sort of computerized voice speaking on a continual basis, all the images that are posted, uh, person of the crowd to Instagram. And if you uh, do it, you can see, I will say it's a little, uh, you don't know when the uh, image is gonna be uh, incorporated into the piece, so it, it will be there, but you might wait a little while. Um, and that's part of the idea of kind of separating from a typical um, experience of the hashtag for an exhibition, where as part of a, a marketing component, you, you have this hashtag and you build a campaign around it. And I wanted to take that idea um, of how we engage with social media and into the context of an actual uh, work of art. And so in my mind, it kind of balances on those two between a, a way of showing how people are interpreting the person in the crowd exhibition, um, as well as how this technology is influencing our relationship to um, social media and our experience of the world in which we live. Um, the next component of the piece is called We Hear. Um, and for that, I worked with the education department here at the Barnes um, with two different groups of high school students. And we went to 30th Street Station. Um, and I, I picked that location because we had, uh, I had heard uh, that the Solari board, which is that fl flip top display that makes all the noise, uh, is gonna be taken down there. Um, and I have such a nostalgic memory of, uh, and experiences of being in 30th Street um, and hearing that sort of reverberation of the space and particularly with that actual display, which marks the passage of time and um, trains coming and going. Um, and it just sounds really cool. And so we went to this location uh, partly for that, but also because it is this kind of transportation hub where people are coming and going. And so what I did is I had the students um, turn, put their planes, their, <laughs> their planes, put their phones in airplane mode, 
Uh, and for 11 minutes, we just sat there in 30th Street and just listened. And the experience was really students were hearing things that they, they were, their relationship to what they were hearing uh, became so amplified. Because if you get really quiet, you start to hear things. And so I had them write down what uh, they heard. And then they uh, spoke to each other, and they filmed it. And so the, the we hear component in the exhibition as it's installed is a video of their describing what they heard. And so if you juxtapose that with what a computer is sort of thinking it's seeing, you have this kind of very subtle relationship between, not subtle at all, actually, but you have this relationship between uh, artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And is there any overlap between the two? Where do we get it right? Where, do, where does it get it wrong? And vice versa. And the, um, the last component, excuse me for one second. It's called We Are, um, which is currently being represented by a Google um, Street View image from right outside here. And this is, uh, consists of the, the website for the exhibition. So it has various information, um, sort of, again, the, the more marketing information, where to buy tickets, um, what is happening and when. And it also has sort of an introduction into this project. But throughout the course of the exhibition, I've been adding materials to it, taking materials away, and kind of working it a little bit like, um, like a, a website as a sculpture, as a sort of a block of clay. And the idea is that we'll continue to kind of evolve and expand throughout the performances that will be happening over the next month. And so um, I'll be documenting those performances and then incorporating my documentation into this website. Um, and this, I should also say that I worked with some uh, really just amazing people here at the Barnes um, to put this together. And I also worked with uh, web developer Brian Feeney, who is like instrumental in getting the website up, um, and a code artist, Kyle McDonald, who um, developed the code for the AI, and also all the students. This couldn't have been done without them. So um, I think my next slide is uh, where it says end here. So thank you. Thanks, guys, so much.